Alexander, here you are. Oh, you're still not thinking about Cosima, are you? Hmm? I suppose I am. Son, it's been months. You've got to pull yourself together. After all, you only met her that once. I know. Have you discovered anything about the land of the Green Isles? No. No one's even heard of it. It's like she's just vanished. I wish I could help. Please try to think about something else, dear. I'll try, Mother. Alexander, I feel so alone. I don't know what to do. Alexander, I wish you were here. Kasima, wait! Mother! Mother, come quick! Alexander, what on earth? You're white as a ghost. Mother, I saw Kasima. She was in the mirror. In the mirror? The magic mirror? Yes! And it showed me how to find her. How? The stars! I saw the stars outside her window. I can navigate by the stars. Oh, Alexander, if you really go... It will be all right, Mother. I promise.
Alexander awakens to find himself on an unfamiliar beach. For a moment, he is too dazed to remember how he got here. Then, he does remember. The shipwreck. The sea. Just as he had seen his men safely into the lifeboats, a gigantic wave picked him up and tossed him overboard into the churning sea. That was the last he'd seen of his crew. Debris from the shipwreck is scattered along the shore, but of the lifeboats and his men, there is thankfully no trace. He can only hope and pray that the lifeboats survived the currents and that his men made their way safely back to Devontree. Alexander's royal insignia ring lies abandoned on the sand. It must have slipped from his finger during the shipwreck. Fortunately, it was not lost in the sea. Alexander picks up his royal insignia ring from the beach. A long plank lies on the beach. No doubt it once belonged to Alexander's ship. Alexander pushes the plank to one side. A box has been partially buried under sand. There's a copper coin in the treasure box. The coin bears the seal of Devontree and King Graham's noble face. There's nothing of interest in that part of the box. Alexander takes the coin and leaves the ruined box where it is. A grand old tree stretches its luxurious limbs out over the crossroads. To the left, a small village seems to invite the weary traveler. A hollow in the trunk of the old tree forms a perfect nesting place for wildlife. In the distance, a majestic castle shines in the sun. There's a little hut just off the path. Perhaps the guard dogs have an occasional use for it, but it looks empty now. Two guards take their stance in front of the castle doors. They look quite fierce and have the stiff, blank expression of soldiers on formal duty. Alexander politely addresses the odd-looking guards at the castle doors, hoping to learn more about his predicament. Good day to you, guards. I was cast upon this island in a storm, and I'm a little confused about my location. Could you tell me what place this is and who lives in this castle? Hey, what is that you say? A castaway? A likely story. We haven't had any foreigners in this part since El Hazaret arrived. Ah, don't be so rude, Gruff. He's not asking for any secrets. You're standing on the Isle of the Crown, lad. And this is the Castle of the Crown. The royal family resides here. Or uh, rather, what's left of the royal family. The Isle of the Crown? But tell me, am I anywhere near the land of the Green Isles? This is the land of the Green Isles. The Isle of the Crown is the main island, foolish boy. Then Princess Cosima must live in this very castle. Aye, the princess is indeed our treasure jewel to God, and we consider it an honor. Alexander promises himself that he will not go home until he has determined what Cosima's feelings are for him, and if she needs his help. Excuse me, guardsmen, uh, uh, guard dogs. I've been traveling for months to see Princess Cosima. I would like an audience, please. I'm sorry, but the princess is not receiving visitors, particularly not strangers.
Alexander's ring is made of the purest gold and has the insignia of the royal family of Daventry on its face. Alexander decides to show his royal insignia ring to the Castle of the Crown Guards. With all of his papers lost in the shipwreck, it is the only possible calling card he can think of. Good day. I'm Prince Alexander of Daventry. I'm an acquaintance of Princess Cassima. If you could just inform her that I'm here, please. <laughs> so everyone says. Let me just look at that ring. What does it say, Gruff? Kingdom of Daventry, Prince Alexander. Ah, wait here while I go see what Captain Saladin thinks of this. The guard returns a moment later with a majestic looking creature. Captain Saladin speaks with a voice that is gentle, but reflects a will of iron. Prince Alexander of Daventry, I presume. I'm afraid I'm unfamiliar with your country, but I'm sure Wazir al Hazred will want to meet you, if indeed you are a friend of the princess. Please, follow me. Lord al a visitor to see you. Prince Alexander of Daventry. What is it that you seek, Prince Alexander? Pardon the intrusion, my lord, but I came to see Princess Cassima. Some months ago, my father, King Graham, saved my family and I from imprisonment under an evil wizard named Mordak. The same wizard that kidnapped the princess? Exactly. When my father rescued us, he also liberated Cassima and sent her home. Then your father has my gratitude, and that of the entire kingdom. But I'm afraid I still fail to see the purpose of your visit. <clears throat> well, I came to make sure that Cassima arrived safely and to pay my respects. Before we parted, she gave me an invitation to visit. I have no doubt she did exactly that at the time, Prince Alexander. However, things have greatly changed for Cosima since her ordeal in Mordak's castle. Cosima's parents both became ill and died while she was gone. Cosima is sequestered in mourning for them as befits a princess. She is not receiving visitors of any kind. Even if she were, I do not think your visit would be appropriate. You see, it is time for Cassima to take her responsibilities seriously. With her parents gone, she no longer has the luxury to be a carefree maiden. As was her parents' wish, Cassima and I are to be wed. We shall rule the kingdom together. I assure you, our marriage is all Cassima wants now. As a prince and a gentleman, it would be best that you leave before there is any further embarrassment. I see. I suppose that I was mistaken. I thought for certain that Cosima... Well, I apologize. A young man sees what he wishes to see. I'm sorry you've wasted your time traveling to the land of the Green Isles. May your journey home be swift. Perhaps I will take the opportunity to look around your fair land while I'm here. I would advise against that. The kingdom is rather, shall we say, inhospitable these days. But it is your neck. You may risk it if you please. Captain Saladin will escort you from the castle. Good day. You have had your hearing with Wazir al Hazred. I trust you'll respect his wishes and not return. I have been instructed not to let you into the castle again. Good day, my lord.
Captain Saladin whispers something to the guard dogs at the castle gate, and they nod with understanding. Alexander has a feeling they won't be letting him into the castle again. Please, if you'll only be reasonable, I really must see the princess. Be gone! You're not welcome at the castle, Prince Alexander of Daventry. We have our orders, and they are quite clear. The sign says Pawn Shop. Towering mightily over the other pawn shop curiosities, the stuffed bear makes an ostentatious display. The back wall of the shop holds various odds and ends. For example, a hull hole detector for finding those hard to spot holes in small sailboats. The pawn shop owner is a mysterious fellow. His face is old and inscrutable, and there's a glint of sheer iron in his gaze. Still, Alexander senses this is someone he can trust. Alexander takes a closer look at the items on the counter. I'm interested in that tinder box on the counter. What do you desire to give me in trade? The items on the front counter are all of equally slight value, worth only a copper or two. They are handy items nonetheless. Alexander takes a mint. Alexander takes a closer look at the items on the counter. I'm interested in that mechanical nightingale on the counter. What do you desire to give me in trade? The items on the front counter are all of equally slight value, worth only a copper or two. They are handy items nonetheless. The small green mint looks very tasty. Alexander is carrying a copper coin of Devantry. King Graham graces the front of the coin. I have this copper coin. Is it of any value to you at all? Hmm, most interesting. I have never seen a Daventry coin before, but it is copper genuine enough. I might even find a buyer who is interested in foreign currency. The items on the front counter are the only things in the store that I can let go for the price of one copper. You may make your choice from there. Alexander looks at the items on the counter to make his selection. The flute is only made of plain wood, but its notes are fine and true. Ah, yes, the painter's brush. It was well used by one of the island's best painters. There's a lot of creativity in that brush, and its bristles are still in good condition. Have you an interest in tinder boxes? This one is only slightly battered. It holds a good supply of flint, a sturdy striking pad, and even a candle in case you find yourself with naught else to hold the flame. I see you have noticed my mechanical nightingale. She is made of plain tin, but she sings the sweetest song you can imagine, barely distinguishable from the real thing. That mechanical nightingale looks intriguing. I believe I'll take it. Very well. Your coin is well spent. Remember, this is a pawn shop. I am always willing to take back my own goods in trade. I'll remember. Thank you. Good day, merchant. What can you tell me about the land of the Green Isles? I can tell you she is in a dark time. Without the ferry, communication between the islands has ground to a halt, and so nearly has my business. 
Why the long ages of peace have ended and why the crown has not done something about it is beyond me. But then, I am a shopkeeper, not a politician, and can only hope for better days. How bide you, good merchant? Quite well, though a purchase would not hurt me any. Alexander examines the large pot. It's currently empty, but a few scraps in the bottom indicate that it is used as a dump site on occasion. The sign above the door says, Ali's Books. Hello, I will be right up. Now, what can I do for you? An old man occasionally steals sidelong glances at Alexander from under a concealing hood. There's a small table near the door that bears a sign. The sign has undergone a number of changes. It once read, 10 pence, but that was crossed out and replaced with 5 pence, then 1 pence, then free. The sign currently reads, take one, please. Only one book remains on the table. It looks like the bookshop owner really wants to get rid of that book. Alexander picks up the book from the small table. Oh yes, please take that book. You have my most humble thanks for doing so good, sir. Really? Thanks! Alexander is carrying a book from the bargain table in the bookshop. Alexander opens the bargain book and reads a paragraph at random. Two dulcimers raised to the degree of forty half dulcimers, divided into equal parts by the third of a cackle of grouse geese, put over the result of ten fine mackles, albeit small fine mackles, stretched over the total of fifty-three and an eighth bottles of wild beast lard. <sighs> Phew, what an incredibly boring book. No wonder the bookshop owner wanted to get rid of it so badly. A stone fireplace gives the bookshop a quaint, cozy air. An antique leather-bound book is displayed on a little stand on the counter. On the elaborate cover is the title, Ye Useful Book of Magic Spells. How much for that book on the counter, merchant? It is a fine book, is it not? I obtained it from the estate of the one and only magician this kingdom has ever had. Poofed himself into an aardvark in the end, or so I heard. I never found the spells all that useful myself, but then I lead a boring life. I tell you what, if you can find another rare book, something a bit more marketable, I might be willing to exchange the spell book for it. Good day, sir. I'm a stranger in this land. What can you tell me about the land of the Green Isles? That is quite a question, young man. Who are you, and what would you have me tell you? My name is Alexander. I know I'm on the Isle of the Crown, but I'd like to know whatever you can tell me about this island, and if there are other islands nearby. You are indeed a stranger. Anxious is the man who knows not the customs of the land beneath his feet. This island is called the Isle of the Crown, because the royal family's castle is here. Besides the castle, we also have this village, and the docks over to the west. 
there are at least three other islands. The Isle of the Sacred Mountain, the Isle of the Beast, and the Isle of Wonder. At least three? Does no one know for certain? <laughs> this is no ordinary land, Alexander. The land of the Green Isles has always been a place of vague boundaries, as if islands come and go. Legend speaks of a fourth island, an isle shrouded in mists. I myself have never seen it. Then too, the land of the Green Isles is said to exist on the boundaries of this world and the next. Even darker places are reputed to be closer here than anywhere else in the world. That's quite a claim. <laughs> claim, yes. But probably just local superstition. We who live here on the Isle of the Crown, at least, sleep well enough at night. Those first three islands you mentioned, how might I learn more about them? Ideally, a young man seeking such knowledge would travel to their shores and learn about them firsthand. Meeting the leaders of each place would be helpful, naturally. Unfortunately, the ferry no longer runs between the islands. There has been much political unrest, and it has been too dangerous to travel for years. Perhaps the ferryman can tell you more. He has little enough to do these days. And if you haven't been there already, you might seek an audience at the castle. Thank you kindly, merchant for all your good advice. Ah, but advice is free, Alexander. Making use of it costs much more. Good day, sir. The mysterious old man just ignores Alexander. There's a young girl in the yard. The girl is dressed in a long, plain orange robe with a thick headdress. From the appearance of her clothes and from a skittish, fearful look about her, Alexander gets the strong impression that she is a servant, or even worse, a slave. The serving girl appears to be stealing a quiet moment tending the rose bushes. The girl is too far away to hold a conversation with Alexander. Alexander doesn't want to intrude on private property unless he's been invited. You lazy thing! Get back to work and stay away from those roses! I've told you a million times, those flowers are too sweet for the likes of you! You've still got to do the breakfast dishes, make lunch, and clean the stables yet this morning! And get your veil back on! No one wants to look at your face! Yes, stepmother. Hey, stranger! Come join me! The water is wonderful, and I can show you the way to the next island. Considering the poor condition of the shore, it looks like the easiest way to get into the water is just to jump off the pier. Powerful currents grab Alexander. Struggle as he might, he feels himself being pulled out to sea. <laughs> Not a very good swimmer, are you? <laughs> Help me! Sorry, I think not. 
As his head submerges for the third time, Alexander finds himself pondering the wisdom of going out on a limb for a stranger. Tickets up! Next! Alexander couldn't handle those currents. That boy must be an unbelievably strong swimmer. Jump in! A little water won't hurt you! That's strange. The young boy in the water just disappeared. Oh well, perhaps he just dove under the water. Yeah, what do you want? Alexander promises himself that he will not go home until he has determined what Cosima's feelings are for him and if she needs his help. The boat does not reply. Alexander promises him. I said the ferry's out of business. What do you want to keep bothering me for? Alexander promised. Excuse me, my name is Alexander. The owner of the bookshop in the village told me you might be able to help me. I hear you used to run this ferry for the islands. I'd like to talk to you if you have a moment. You say old Ali sent you? I can't see why. The ferry's not running, you know. I understand. I'd just like to talk to you about the islands if you don't mind. Well, I guess it'd be all right, if Ali sent you. Well, don't just stand there. Come on inside. What is it you wanted to talk about, young man? I'm a visitor to these islands. I'd like to learn what I can about the area. So you said outside. What is it you want to know? Well, for one thing, why has the island's only ferry been dry docked? Huh. It just ain't safe to sail these days. What with the islands feuding and all. Wazir al Hazred ordered the ferry closed till things settled down. Me? I don't think she'll ever see water again. <sighs> but why are the islands feuding? You got me. Something about stolen property or some such thing. Tis a real shame. Things used to be so friendly. Then this unrest is recent. A few years is all, but it's been long enough. Perhaps if the ferry were repaired... This old thing? This ferry's been out of water so long she's no longer even seaworthy. Her boards have dry rot. She'd fall apart at the first taste of seawater. But there must be some way to get off this island. There's only one other way to travel that I know of. A magic map. The owner of the pawn shop can tell you more about that than I can, Alexander. Tell me more about the ferry. I remember when I used to ferry Queen Alaria and Princess Cosima themselves. There was no thought of danger back then. They used to go visiting to care for the needy and to keep up the friendly relations between the islands. I remember their last trip. Things had started getting nasty by then, and when they came back aboard, I gathered that the Queen and the Princess had been received a bit coldly. Princess Cosima was such a pretty thing, and she was terribly upset. But who could be spreading these lies, she asked the Queen, but the Queen had no answer. What do you do now that the ferry no longer operates? Me? I'm out of a job. The job my ancestors have held for generations. I'm the only one trained to avoid the reef and the rocks. But that knowledge does me no good now. Is there no other boat on the island? One that might be more seaworthy? 
Boats don't last long on these shoals, as you may have found out if you got here by ship. You can be quite sure that this old ferry is, or was, the only craft on the island. Tell me more about Princess Cosima. Ah, such a beautiful child, and so pure of heart. Why, a contrary thought has never crossed her mind. Her mother was the same, the king and queen. They served the islands, not the other way around. Always thinking about the people. Ah, they are sorely missed. What else can you tell me about the land? Let's see. The Isle of Wonder's a lovely spot. A bit crazy, mind you. Gotta have a good sense of humor to enjoy a tour there. What else can you tell me about the land? The Isle of the Beast is pretty, but unfortunately, you can't get very far onto the island. The ferryman seems to be the only one in the cabin to address. What else can you tell me about the land? The inhabitants of the Isle of the Sacred Mountain are the most gorgeous creatures you'll ever see. If you ever get to see them, that is. What else can you tell me about the land? The Castle of the Crown sure is a beauty. She's the finest palace ever built, I'll warrant. The chair does... What else can you tell me about the land? Some say that the land of the Green Isles is near the edge of the world, and that the deadly currents are a result of a magnetism that sucks life from this world to the next. Of course, that's just silly talk. What else can you tell me about the land? Let's see. The Isle of Wonder's a lovely spot. There's a rabbit's foot on the table. It seems the ferryman is counting on a little luck. I see you have a rabbit's foot. Has it brought you much luck? As you can see, my luck's been out for some time now, despite that old charm. Why don't you take it with you? Perhaps giving the darn thing away will bring me good fortune at last. Perhaps it will at that. Thank you. Well, I think I'll be going now. Thanks for allowing me into your home. Posh, not at all. It breaks the boredom, if you know what I mean. Good day again. How may I help you? Good day, sir. Is there anything you can tell me about the land of the Green Isles? I'm sorry, but I have no time for idle conversation. I'm too worried about the princess. Excuse me again, sir. You mentioned the princess. I told you, I'm not interested in talking to strangers. Alexander sees no use for that item there. Determined to learn more about the strange man's relationship with the princess, Alexander shows the man his insignia ring and formally introduces himself. I'm sorry to insist, but my name is Alexander of Daventry and... I appreciate the offer of the ring, Alexander, but I'm afraid I'm already spoken. Daventry? Where have I heard of Daventry? Flying flipmice? You must be Prince Alexander. Cosima told me about you when she arrived home. How came you here? Why, by a ship now wrecked upon the sand. But you know Cosima? She truly spoke of me? Yes, yes, I, I saw her briefly when she first returned home. She mentioned a prince to me, a Prince Alexander of Daventry. I'm afraid that was before she was told about her parents' deaths. You see, she arrived home a few weeks too late. The king and queen thought they'd never see her again. 
It is said they died of heartbreak. I'm afraid she's blamed herself. What a terrible homecoming. If we had only known. <laughs> terrible indeed, poor thing. Everyone in the kingdom seems to despair with her these days. The streets are silent. Where is she now? The princess is sequestered in mourning. It's a rather dated tradition, and not required, but the wazir says she insisted out of respect. I see. You've yet to say who you are, and how you know the princess. I? Oh, pardon me. My name is Chalo. I am clown to the royal court, and have been since the marriage of Cassima's parents, King Caliphon and Queen Alaria. Oh, those were the happy days. The pair of them were so full of joy and life, so in love. And Cassima's birth. It would be hard to explain how long they had waited, how they had hoped for a child. I mean, she was such a charming little thing, smart as a whip, kind and sweet. Oh, she means everything to this kingdom, Alexander, and to me. I'm so terribly worried about her. About her grief over her parents, you mean? Well, the truth is, I do not trust the Wazir or his plans for Kasima. I'm still living at the Castle of the Crown as Court Clown, his clown. But it is more to keep my ear to the ground than out of loyalty. I wish I knew what the princess thinks these days. <sighs> if only I could find Sing Sing, Cosima's pet nightingale. I might be able to send the princess a message. As it is, I must wait for the end of her seclusion. Now I'm afraid I must hurry back to the castle. I'll try to return to the bookshop again later. Thank you for speaking with me, Jalo. I hope we meet again soon. mysterious old man also patronizes the pawn shop. He steals sidelong glances at Alexander from under his hood. Excuse me, merchant. But the ferryman mentioned that you might have a magic map of the land of the Green Isles. Why, as a matter of fact, I do. I keep it under the counter. It's been gathering dust so long that I nearly forgot about it. It was quite a few years ago, you see. The estate of a wealthy wizard fell into my hands when he died. It was useless magical junk mostly, which reminds me, I've still got some things of his in the back that I need to dump out. Anyway, the magic map was the one true treasure in the lot. The wizard was quite old and feeble and had enchanted the map to aid in traveling. It is said that one need only desire to be on an island depicted on the map to find oneself there. It is a very valuable map, as you can imagine. Unfortunately, no one is interested in traveling these days. It is far too dangerous with the current state of the kingdom. What would you take for the map? I would normally want something magic in return, but since I am hardly overrun with prospective buyers, I would be willing to take anything of equal value in exchange. If Alexander wants to exchange one of his possessions for an item in the pawn shop, he'll have to arrange it with the pawn shop owner first by showing him the object for trade. Would you be willing to take my family ring in exchange for the magic map? Daventry, are you a king then? No, that's my father, King Graham. I'm just Alexander. Well, Prince Alex, she is a beautiful ring. 
Are you sure you can part with such a unique family heirloom? The ring does mean a lot to me. I didn't always have a family, you know. Still, it is only gold. There are more important things at stake now. Then you now own a magic map, Prince Alex. I will keep your ring out of sight for a few days. If you find anything else of great value in your travels, you can come back for your ring. I would hate to see it melted down for gold. Ah, and a warning about the map. It will only operate when you are out in the open and within sight of the sea. The limitation has something to do with the teleport spell ingredients. You might try the beach. Thank you. You are very kind. And I'll remember about the map. Suddenly, the old man in the concealing cloak sneaks past Alexander and with a sneaky dart of his hand, steals a mint from the candy jar. The old man stuffs the mint into his mouth and wobbles unsteadily out of the pawn shop. Master! I follow Prince Alexander as you wished from the pawn shop owner he just abstained uh, just reprieved uh, uh, he just got a magic map you fool you've been eating those mints again i ordered you to stop that yes oh, master now what is this about a magic map? With a map, Prince Alexander could travel anywhere as quickly as, uh, quickly as I can. I thought I took care of the only means of travel. By my scimitar, I can't have him stirring things up now. Get a hold of yourself and listen carefully, Shamir. Go to the other islands and tell them Alexander is carrying a book from the bargain table in the bookshop. Alexander opens the bargain book and reads a paragraph at random. Two dulcimers raised to the degree of forty half dulcimers, divided into equal parts. Mm. Phew, what an incredibly boring book. No wonder the bookshop owner wanted to get rid of it so badly. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander notices an unusually large, coal-black feather lying on the beach. Alexander takes the feather. There's an ugly flower growing near the base of the cliff. Alexander picks the flower and is startled by its hideously strong, skunk-like odor. For a moment, he can smell nothing else.
Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. A large round pot is one... Alexander sorts through the odds and ends that the pawn shop owner dumped into the pot. Magic exploding gum wrappers, a shattered crystal ball, a cracked wand, a fake thumb. Hmm. Near the bottom, Alexander finds a little glass bottle labeled ink. It appears to be empty, but Alexander decides to take it anyway. You never know when a small bottle will come in handy. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. A string of letters floats in the water. The letters spell out, where are you going? Alexander's heard of alphabet soup, but this is ridiculous. One of the oysters is sitting up in bed and doesn't look very happy. He seems to be the only one who can't sleep. <clears throat> in the oyster's mouth, Alexander can see a glint of white. Why aren't you asleep like the other oysters? in my mouth. Why don't you let me see if I can help? No way! No one's looking in my mouth. I hate dentists. If you're having trouble sleeping, perhaps you'd like me to read to you. Two dulcimers raised to the degree of forty half dulcimers divided into equal parts by the third of a cackle of grouse geese put over the result of ten fine mackles, albeit small fine mackles, stretched over the total of fifty-three and an eighth bottles of wild beast lard. Mm. Yields a gilded minnow of precise measurements 2,069 centadrills by 3,023 and 6 sevenths puns, not punts, as might be expected. This is not to say, however, in any sense whatsoever, that deviations in mean temperature of 5 or 6 dregs or so. Mm. Alexander makes a grab for the pearl. The little oyster drifts into peaceful slumber with the rest of his oyster friends. Alexander wades into the sea to get the strange object in the water. The ocean currents tug at Alexander's legs. Hmm, that object is just a bit out of reach. Alexander wades into the sea to get the strange object in the water. The ocean currents tug at Alexander's legs. Hmm, 
that object is just a bit out of reach. Alexander hears someone coming. I've hear scars of the IOBB. Watch for a foreign man, said he. With ears and nose, tongue, hands and eyes. Its nature cannot be disguised. If man it be, then man it dies. Control, smell your smell. Do that which you do so well. Alexander holds the flower of stench out to the gnome with the jumbo nose. Tom Troll I am, that's all I'll be. My nose knows all on land and sea. A flower of stench has washed ashore. A flower tis all and nothing more. Listen, hark you, Roganor. Do your duty as you swore. With your ears, please tell us more. Alexander winds the tin nightingale and plays it for the gnome with the monumental ears. A nose is not a way to spy. My ears cannot be told a lie. A nightingale is all there be. No man is near, and so say me. Taste, Rump Trump, that we might know whether the friend or whether the foe. Alexander holds the mint out for the gnome with the gigantic mouth. Grump Frump knows a tasty treat. It matters not what others bleat. No danger is this one so sweet. Trilly Dilly, use your hands. Is it beast or is it man? Alexander holds the rabbit foot out for the gnome with the huge hands. Be all you mad? What aileth thee? A bunny can't trill merrily. A hair does not at all taste sweet. A rabbit here is all we greet. Old Bill Batter, never fatter. Vision can resolve this matter. Look you now, and end this chatter. Alexander pours the contents of the empty-looking ink bottle over himself. By all that's beauteous, fair, and sightly, four morons do I sleep with nightly. There's nothing there at all, I say. Enough of this. Let's now away. Alexander did it. He's fooled the guards. Alexander picks up the object floating in the water. It appears to be a string of letters. They say, where are you going? Alexander decides to keep the odd sentence, even though it is incomplete.
Mm, wow. Hiya, gorgeous. Oh, what a luscious-looking hunk of flesh you are. Uh, thank you, I guess. Who are you? <gasps> How charming of you to pretend not to know. I'm Black Widow, of course. The femme fatale of all femme fatales. Know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I was just thinking it was time I found my 50th, uh, another husband. It would be quite a horror. Uh, I mean, an honor to have me as a bride. <laughs> just look at my beautiful weaving. It's so light, so delicate. You'll never want to leave my little nest. It is a lovely web. But my heart is elsewhere, I'm afraid. Oh, drat! Uh, <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> the loss is yours. I'm sure you'll change your mind once you consider the advantages. Hey! Don't touch that thread! Alexander snatches the scrap of parchment, curious to see what's written on it. The wind blows the scrap of paper from Alexander's hand, but he remembers what it said well enough. What do you think you're doing? I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize these books had an owner. I'm in need of a rare book. <laughs> no owner? All books have owners, my good man. And this book owner, bookworm to you, wouldn't part with one of his books for anything. Isn't there something I can do for you to pay for the book? Hmm, let's see. Do you have an itinerant clause? No. No clauses at all, I'm afraid. As an exception, you always should! <laughs> Don't mind Oxymoron and Diphthong. They're fairly limited grammatical principles, you know. Hmm, let's see. A marsh pig that does Texas? Uh, no. I'm afraid not. A dangling participle? I'm fresh out. A purple fiddlewhacker? No, I don't think so. Sorry. An idiosyncrasy, perhaps? Right not. Ha! Huh, then what good are you? Are you there? Most venerable bookworm. Do you have anything interesting yet? A regular abnormality? Uh, let me see what I have. Would you take this in exchange for a rare book? You want to trade that? There are millions of those lying about. No thank you. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Jello, how fare you? And what news have you from the castle? Prince Alex, how I fare is close to boiling. 
Have you seen the wedding proclamations around the village? I've heard rumors of the wedding, of course, but I didn't want to believe it, and I never thought it would be so soon. Kasima, married. Oh, it is an unpleasant thing to swallow, friend. If only I knew Kasima wished it. Tell me about the Wazir, Jalo. The Wazir? <laughs> now there's a dangerous subject. His name is Abdul al Hazret. He came to the kingdom 15 years ago. The king was fascinated by his knowledge and his fine-sounding ideas. It didn't take long for al Hazret to convince the king to trust him with the minor problems of daily government. You see, Kalafim had a wife and a new daughter he wanted to spend time with. al Hazret became wazir. And now? Well, he's had his eye on Kasima ever since she was a young girl. And she is the only thing between him and the throne. Do you think he means to harm her? Oh, I honestly don't know. I think he'd rather keep her his wife. But whatever his plans for the princess, he will use her to his best advantage. That's his way. Perhaps he has charmed her. Perhaps she cares for him now. The Wazir is capable of anything, and Kasima must be vulnerable and lonely right now. Still, she has always instinctively distrusted him. Kasima has a good head on her shoulders. I'd be surprised if she's truly fallen for his words of love. I must return to the castle, Prince Alex, and you to your wanderings. May we both farewell. How might I obtain that spell book again? As I said, I would take another rare book in exchange. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. A little fawn is feeding on a grassy hillock near the sea. There's an odd little creature dangling from that tree branch. Hello, friend. Aren't you an odd-looking little fellow? I'm not odd-looking you are! Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you could speak. Speak not? Funny is, speech I am and nothing but. You speak strangely, friend. Strange, my speech is not eloquence I speak with. But who are you? And why are you here? Away I fly my home from. Lost I am, therefore. Huh. As my name, too, can you guess not? It's what I do this branch with, and the way I speak of. Alexander holds the sentence out to the creature. This sentence seems in need of an ending. Perhaps you could finish it? Where are you going? Where are you going? Know what I do? Where are you going to? Like you I do. Go I with you. Well. That was certainly interesting. It looks like Alexander now has a passenger.
Alexander pulls out his magic map. Nothing happens. Apparently, the map won't teleport its user anywhere except the other islands. It's a good thing, too. Alexander has had enough of ocean swimming lately. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander sees no use for that item there. Do you have anything interesting yet? A subordinate clause, maybe? Uh, let me see what I have. I found this little fellow lost on another island. Coming home I am too! There you are, you naughty boy! I told you not to leave the island! Glad I am seeing you too! A most <laughs> solemn celebration! <laughs> So, you found my dangling participle. I suppose I'll have to give you something. Oh, let's see now. Was it a rare book you wanted? Yes, sir. Well, then none of these will do. They've been sitting in the sun far too long and must be well cooked by now. This one is far more rare. A delicious little tidbit. Mm. Uh, thanks. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Hello. I will be right up. Now, what can I do for you? There's no reason to use that on the books. I found this rare book, and I thought of your offer. Very interesting. Oh, it is a wonderful riddle book. Riddles are much more marketable than spells these days. I guess people believe more in mirth than in magic. Here is the spell book you wanted, and a fair trade it is, I must say. Enjoy it. I certainly hope so. We shall see how rusty my spell casting truly is. Your candy dish is empty! I am sorry, sir, but I have no more mints. Somebody has eaten them all. Well, get some more, then! I fear that is impossible. Without the fairy, I can no longer get imports from the other island, and we do not grow mint extract on the Isle of the Crown. Oh, I hate not getting what I want! The flawless pearl is the largest Alexander's ever seen.
I found this large pearl. Might it be valuable enough to ransom back my family ring? I have never seen such a perfect pearl. Certainly you can have your ring back. Oh, I'm glad you didn't sell it. I'm a bit attached to it, I'm afraid. Of course you are. You would be cold-hearted if you felt any differently. I am happy to see a family heirloom back with its rightful owner. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander doesn't see a reason to put that in the tree's hop. Alexander examines the tree's hollow, but finds nothing of interest. Alexander winds the mechanical nightingale and places it on the ground. The mechanical nightingale sings a sweet, tinny tune. The real nightingale in the tree cocks her head and listens intently. The nightingale flies to a lower branch and looks at Alexander curiously, as if she were deciding that this human might not be so bad. Alexander holds out his insignia ring to the nightingale, hoping she perhaps is the nightingale that Jalo spoke of, and that she might be able to take the ring to Cosima. The ring is the one thing he has that might alert Cosima to his presence on the Isles. The nightingale swoops down and grabs the ring. She flies off towards the castle, perhaps to Cosima? Sing, sing. What have you got in your mouth, my pretty? A gold ring? <gasps> sing, sing. Where did you get this? Realm of Daventry. But this is Alexander's ring. Oh, my soul. He must be here. Sing, sing. I wish you could tell me what you've seen. Is he really here, then? On this very island? Oh, if only I could leave this castle as easily as you. Take this ribbon, Sing Sing. If you know where he is, return it to him. Please be careful, Alexander. It is so dangerous, and yet I could not wish you away. The little bird makes a delivery. It's a red velvet hair ribbon. Could it be? Could it possibly belong to Cosima herself? Or am I merely wishing it were so? Oh. The lady's hair ribbon is made of the finest red velvet. A long strand of black hair is caught in the ribbon. Alexander examines the red ribbon and finds a strand of long black hair. Good day, Prince Alexander. Would you mind if I traded this in? Of course, Prince Alex. Please, choose something in exchange for the items on the counter. 
Alexander looks closely at the items on the counter to make his selection. I'll take the flute. The flute? Very good, Prince Alex. May its music always be sweet. Feel free to trade it back at any time. Thank you. Hello. I will be right up. Now, what can I do for you? Thinking of Cosima, Alexander decides to leaf through one of the volumes of love poetry. He reads, Thy hair, thy lips, thy beauteous face, and all thy studied female grace have won for thee anon a place within this broken breast. Not bad. And another. Upon the shore the lilies bend, untouched by worldly care, where shadow they her earthly bed, oh, that she were not there. Yikes! And another. What was it when I looked at you? What power has chained me through and through and binds my heart with links so tight I cannot live without the sight of you? What nameless thing has captured me and made me powerless to flee? What thing is it without a name that brings my mind e'er back the same to thee? The name of love cannot apply. Its commonness does not decry the haunted, hunted, painful cry that my heart makes for you, that e'er my soul eternal makes for you. Hmm. A little close to home, that one. Alexander returns the love poem book to the shelf. Alexander picks up the fallen page. It's the love poem he particularly liked. It must have fallen out of the poetry book. I see that old volume has lost another page. You may keep it if you like, sir. I have glued the stubborn thing back in place two times already. I do rather like it. Thank you, merchant. The nightingale sings her crystalline song in the boughs of the old tree. The nightingale looks at Alexander curiously, as though waiting for something. Alexander holds out the love poem, hoping that the bird will deliver it to the same place she took the ring, in the chance that the receiver might truly be Cosima. The nightingale swoops down, grabs the love poem, and takes it towards the castle. Sing, sing, my sweet. You bring another present. Let me see. It is a poem, sing, sing. What was it when I looked at you? What power has chained me through and through, and binds my heart with links so tight I cannot live without the sight of you. Oh, Alexander. I was hoping he'd return to you. Take this to him while he waits. Hurry, my fleet one. The little bird makes a delivery. The nightingale has dropped a bit of paper on the ground. It's a note. Dearest Alexander, I cannot believe you are here, my friend. Please, please be careful. Abdul isn't about to let anyone interfere with his plans. Watch out for Abdul's genie, Alexander, and do not do anything rash. I am not without resources, and I will prevail if I can only find some small means of defense. Do nothing to try to get to me. 
you must not be endangered again for my sake. Greatly in your family's debt, Cosima. Alexander's hand trembles as he reads the note. For the first time in his long search, he has heard her voice again, if only in writing. No words of love, only friendly concern. Friend. Is the maiden merely shy, or does she regard him only as a brother? Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Milkweed thrives near the mucky swamp. Small bottles filled with milk grow on it like fruit. A large tree stretches knotted limbs out over the swamp. Part of the tree's trunk is shaped like the face of a dog. Why, it must be a dogwood tree. The fallen log has a good-sized knot or bump. Alexander takes a bottle of milk from the milkweed bush. Apparently, the dogwood tree doesn't like Alexander standing that close. Unless Alexander is mistaken, those plants must be baby's tears. Alexander takes a close look at the tomato on the ground. It appears to be darker than those on the vines. What are you staring at there, boy? Go away, you rootless thing, you! Yeah! Yep, that tomato is definitely rotten. Hey, what do you think you're doing there? Get your hands off me! Hey! Alexander picks up Rotten Tomato and puts him away. One never knows when one will need a Rotten Tomato. Is that lettuce growing in the garden? It looks a little chilled. Why? Alexander picks a head of iceberg lettuce. Ye gads! Is that cold? Good day, tomato vines. Good morning. Hello. Aren't you a bunch of fine-looking young plants? Go, go, Gaga! Apparently, the baby's tears haven't learned to talk yet. Greetings, ladies. How charming you look today. <laughs> the wallflowers are too shy to talk to Alexander. May I have this dance? Oh, my! Alexander stops playing the flute, but the wallflowers and snapdragons continue to dance, caught up in the music and oblivious to everything around them. There are 
appears to be a hole in the garden wall. Through the hole in the wall, Alexander sees a land that resembles a giant chessboard. Wow, it really is a hole in the wall. Zounds! Those wallflowers sure are shy, and the snapdragons are awfully protective of them. Alexander can't even get close to the wallflowers without causing quite a stir. Alexander decides to pick up the hole in the wall. A hole in the wall could be a very useful thing. Alexander startled the poor thing. It's run off to hide behind the wallflowers. May I have this dance? Alexander stops playing the flute, but the wallflowers and snapdragons continue to dance, caught up in the music and oblivious to everything around them. While the wallflowers dance, Alexander snatches the hole in the wall. Alexander takes the teacup. Checkmate! Only chess pieces allowed in chessboard land! That's right! Humans aren't allowed in and never will be! Stay out! I must insist, Your Highness. I shall send the lump of coal to the Wizier and the Princess as a present for their wedding, and that's the end of it. And I suppose you'll leave me with only this stupid spoiled egg to send, Your Highness. I want to impress the new King and Queen of the Realm as much as you do. As Queen of this island, I have every right to that lump of coal. Who isn't Queen of this isle? The lump of coal is in my possession, therefore I shall do as I please with it. Besides, there's nothing wrong with that spoiled egg. The egg, though delightfully spoiled, is not nearly so valuable as the lump of coal, and you know it. Your Highness always got to carry the singing stone. It's not fair that you get the coal, too. That doesn't count. The singing stone was stolen by that horrid beast. I should get to keep the coal just because my stone was stolen. It wasn't your stone. It belonged to the Isle of Wonder Treasury. Your Highness always thinks that everything is hers. Excuse me, my good man, but could you settle an argument for us? Which of us should get to carry the coal and which the egg? Remember, white is the color of deserving truth and virtue. Quiet, Your Highness, and let him make up his own mind. I, for one, shall be more proper and not even mention the fact that red is the color of love. I'm sorry, Your Majesties. I'm partial to both red and white, but I'm afraid that I don't know how to solve your problem. One of you will just have to be gracious and allow the other the lump of coal. What a ridiculously stupid idea! Quite ludicrous. He was a lot of help, wasn't he? Oh yes, obviously a man of high intelligence. The 
the lump of coal goes much better with my gown anyway. Black and red are imperial colors. That's the silliest thing I ever heard. Red does not go with anything, being much too self-conscious. White is the perfect accompaniment to any color. The Red Queen has dropped her scarf on the steps. Alexander picks up the Red Queen's scarf. Alexander is carrying what little remains of a head of iceberg lettuce. The lettuce is rapidly melting. Alexander replaces his watery lettuce with a freshly picked specimen. Ye gads! Is that cold? Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. pond lies across the path. The water boils as if over some magical flame. Hoping to cool down the boiling pond, Alexander throws in a head of iceberg lettuce. The pond's water slowly stops boiling, cooled by the ice. It still looks hot but bearable. An old abandoned hunter's lamp is hanging on one of the trees. Alexander wonders who might have hunted in these dense woods. Alexander decides to brave the steaming pond. Ouch! Ow! Ooh, 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 ouch! The pond is no longer boiling, but it's hardly bathwater. Alexander takes the old hunter's lamp from the tree. As Alexander continues down the path, he gets the strange feeling that he's being watched. Come on over here and see what I'm doing with these flowers. Never mind that stone fella on top of the gate. He won't hurt you any. He's just there to scare you. Alexander picks up the brick. You aren't going to listen to me, are you? Well, we'll just see about that. That's odd. The gardener just disappeared. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Good day, Prince Alexander. Would you mind if I traded this in? 
Of course, Prince Alex, please choose something in exchange for the items on the counter. Alexander looks closely at the items on the counter to make his selection. I believe I'll take the tinderbox. Very good, Prince Alex. Enjoy your tinderbox and bring it back anytime. Thank you. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. There appears to be something etched into the face of the cliff. Alexander decides to get closer. The rock has been etched by some unknown hand. One may need to read about the logic cliffs in the guidebook to the land of the Green Isles in order to understand this mystical inscription. Huge blocks of stone erupt from the granite cliffs. Alexander stares with wonder. That's quite a way to welcome a guest, if indeed it is a welcome. Alexander examines the strange etchings in the face of the cliff. Reading about the ancient ones in the guidebook to the land of the Green Isles may help a puzzled journeyer. The stone beneath Alexander's feet trembles as more steps emerge from the granite cliffs. Alexander examines the strange etchings in the face of the cliff. Four plain stone buttons have been carved into the cliffs. One may need to read about the logic cliffs in the guidebook to the land of the Green Isles in order to understand these stones. The stone beneath Alexander's feet trembles as more steps emerge from the granite cliffs.
Alexander examines the strange etchings in the face of the cliff. Reading about the ancient ones in the guidebook to the land of the Green Isles may help a puzzled journeyer. The stone beneath Alexander's feet trembles as more steps emerge from the granite cliffs. Whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Alexander examines the strange etchings in the face of the cliff. The stone beneath Alexander's feet trembles as more steps emerge from the granite cliffs. Alexander finds himself, finally, at the top of the cliffs. Exhausted, he steps over the lip of the plateau and stands. Why do you make such an effort to climb the cliffs, young man? The winged ones who live on this island have the power of flight. You could have it too, if you'd only eat a berry from this magical flying nightshade bush. Sweet berries will make you float like a petal on the wind. <laughs> Try some. Come, stranger, trust me. Think of what I'm offering you. Offend me! I try to help you and you insist on being rude! All right then! Stay tied to the ground like a load of lead! See if I care! You... 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 human... How odd! The old woman just disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Perhaps those berries are even more powerful than she led Alexander to believe. Huge doors are set into the solid rock of the mountain. In the distance, Alexander can see the peak of a majestic mountain rising into the clouds. Black berries grow only at the top of the bush, as though straining towards the sun. Alexander crawls through the small opening in the rock. Mm -hmm. 
Alexander finds himself in a dark cave. exactly like a tinderbox. Alexander takes the candle from his tinderbox and uses the flint in the box to light it. On the wall opposite the cliffs is the vague outline of another opening in the rock. Alexander crawls through the opening in the rock. The lighting in this part of the cave is better. Alexander extinguishes the candle's flame and places it back in his pack. A plant grows on the grassy ledge. Hmm, smells like peppermint. Alexander takes a few leaves from the plant. As he does so, a strong smell of peppermint is released. Ah! The window in the rock is too small for Alexander to fit through. Alexander crawls back into the first room of the cave. Alexander can't see a thing. Alexander crawls back through the passage to the top of the cliffs. Look, an intruder! Hold! How did you get up here, human? I climbed the cliffs. That is not possible. No one has solved the cliffs of logic in several centuries. And if the cliffs were to be solved, it would certainly not be by a human. I... I didn't mean to trespass. I only wanted to visit this beautiful island. No visitors have been welcome on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain in years. Not since the Red and White Queens had spies in the guise of friendly visitors steal our island's sacred golden fleece. But we will not display such foolish trust again. You will have to answer to Lord Azure and Lady Ariel. They will determine what will be done with you. I can assure you, it will not be pleasant. With what trickery did you master the Cliffs of Logic and reach the city of the Winged Ones? Only the magic of clear thought, my lord. I meant no harm. The Cliffs of Logic? It is the sacred oracle's prophecy, Azur. Yes, Ariel. Hmm. It is lucky for you, human, that climbing the Cliffs of Logic is part of a prophecy that I cannot ignore. We have just been ordered by Wazir Al-Hazred himself to dispose of any strangers that might land on our fair isle. But the prophecy would have a different fate befall you. The prophecy predicts that whosoever climbs the Cliffs of Logic will defeat the Minotaur. The Minotaur has violated our sacred catacombs and eats our young in sacrifice. Our own daughter, Lady Celeste, was taken there only this morning as his most recently demanded offering. A dilemma, then. Whom shall I obey in regards to your fate? The Oracle or the Crown? But since al Hazred did not dictate how I was to dispose of intruders, and since you cannot possibly survive the catacombs, your imprisonment there should serve both purposes quite admirably. I will not resist you in this, my lord. I shall do my best to save your daughter. Hmm. 
First, I must tell you that the catacombs are a labyrinth of rooms, a place of exceeding danger. You will need many tools and clear wits to survive it. I am ready. Very well. My guards will take you there now. You seem courageous enough, but the catacombs will determine how brave you really are. Why did you tell Lord Azure you were ready and willing to face the catacombs? No one is ever ready, and only a fool could be willing. And you are far wiser, I suppose, to leave a maiden to die? To not fight this plague on your own people? Bravery and suicide are two different things, human. You will have a chance to renounce your choice soon enough, when you lay trembling under the Minotaur's hooves. We shall see. Thanks for the... Escort. We only escort you to your death. May the fates make it quick so that you do not have to scream long. The catacomb's entrance door is locked from the outside by the winged one's guards. It seems that leaving the catacombs by that door is not an option. Niches in the wall form stone burial beds. Ancient bones lie crumbling on the unyielding rock. of several unfortunate souls haunt the room. These bones seem more recent than the ancient catacomb bones that Alexander has seen so far. Perhaps they were victims of the Minotaur, or perhaps they died while wandering lost in the maze. Three of the skeletons are completely intact. Alexander picks up the skull. on the wall. Alexander takes the shield from the wall. in the wall form stone burial beds. Alexander notices that this skeleton has old coins over its eyes. Mm -hmm. 
Alexander finds two coins on the skeleton's eyes. He takes the old coins. Alexander hears the distant sounds of a wild animal somewhere in the maze of rooms. It's a trap. The doors have sealed Alexander inside. And the ceiling is coming down. In a desperate move, Alexander throws a brick into the grinding gears. The brick is caught between two cogs. The gears shriek and shudder. The mechanism grinds to a halt. The ceiling is stuck. The trap is sprung. A trap floor! Alexander seems to have fallen to a lower level of the catacombs. Wherever he is, the place sure is dark. Alexander can't even see his hand in front of his face. Alexander takes the candle from his tinder box and uses the flint in the box to light it. Aha! So that's why it's dark in here. A torch is out. Alexander lights the extinguished torch and puts his tinder box away. Alexander hears a low growling, so faint as to seem born of his fired imagination rather than of any living creature. Alexander hears the sound of a wild beast again, this time so loud that the creature itself seems to be in the same room with him. The noises are coming from the other side of the east wall. Alexander puts the hole in the wall on the east wall. The hole in the wall trembles slightly with dread at the clammy feeling of the stones. Alexander peers through the hole in the wall and sees just another room in the catacombs. Aha! Not just another room at all. So that's why Alexander couldn't find the Minotaur's lair. At least Alexander now knows the lair exists somewhere in the maze on the other side of this wall. While Alexander contemplates what he's just seen, the hole in the wall, frightened by the Minotaur, makes a run for it. Alexander hopes the little creature finds its way home to the Isle of Wonder. Thank you.
somewhere, far off into the catacombs, the sounds of hooves faintly echo. very dusty tapestry hangs on the wall. Hmm, this tapestry looks familiar. Now let's see. I don't feel anything. Aha! A hidden latch. Alexander triggers the little latch. A secret door rolls open. Struggles are useless. It's the Minotaur, and he's struggling with a winged one's girl. She must be Lady Celeste. Excuse me. I demand the release of that maiden this instant, you fiend. Lady Celeste looks wildly around the room for the source of the strange voice, and spots Alexander. I ask you to release your captive or suffer the consequences. Never you die, human. As the Minotaur advances in attack, Alexander slowly backs away. Until he can back away no more. Now where to, little man? The scarf is made of red silk. Alexander, his back inches from the fiery pit, tempts the Minotaur with the Red Queen's scarf. Look here, you bully! Nice, bright red. You die! The Minotaur drops from sight amidst the consuming flames. Slowly, his scream fades as well. Have you been harmed, Lady Celeste? Are you all right? No, I am not all right. I assume you do not intend to leave me tied up on this vile monstrosity. Uh, of course not. Sorry. Let's see. If you'll give me a moment, I'll have these untied in no time. I can't wait that long. Look, I wear a small dagger just inside my belt. It should be enough to cut the rope. Oh, all right. I, I've got it, Lady Celeste. Here we go. You may keep the dagger as a gift for saving my life. That's very generous. Forget it. Do you mind if we just get out of here now? The Winged One's guards, bored with the pointless waiting, are startled by the sound of rock moving against rock. Lady Celeste, bide thee well. I'm quite well, thanks to the bravery of a mere human. So much for your superior intellect. Yes, me lady. Now bring him along. I'm going home. I see you have proven yourself the hero of the prophecy. 
Well, I am expected to thank you for saving my daughter's life. So I thank you. I am obliged to thank you for the restoration of our sacred catacombs. It means much to our people. We have already begun the process of clearing the deadly traps from its rooms. It is also my duty to grant you a visit with the Oracle. So this I do. I will grant you the freedom to leave here unharmed, despite my orders to the contrary from the Crown. But there, my obligations to you end. I have no love for Alhazred, but he is my liege, and if Princess Kasima trusts him and wishes to wed him, my guards will take you to the Oracle now. When your time with her is through, I want you to leave the City of the Winged Ones and never return. I don't know who you are or what you want here, but I will not disobey my crown further. I thank you, Lord Azure. I will respect your wishes. Hail to thee, great oracle. Lord Azure sends you this wingless mail. It appears that he solved the cliffs of logic and... Defeated the Minotaur in his lair. So I have seen. So this is the one that haunts my pool of late. Welcome, young seeker. What knowledge do you desire? Princess Kasima, whatever you can tell me, great oracle. Ah, of course, the princess. That explains my images. Let us see what we can see. I see a maiden, lovely and pure, but surrounded by evil. She is a rose set amidst bitter thorns. It is her fate to be the pawn of dark powers, and yours to try to redeem her. How? How do I redeem her? Fate is not like the cut of a blade, young one, but rather like the myriad of paths formed when a hammer cracks ice. I will tell you what I can, but what will actually come to pass is up to you. I see that any attempt to reach the girl will force you into battle, a struggle against a dark force. If you lose, your life will be forfeit. Who must I fight? A great darkness surrounds your adversary, preventing me from seeing clearly. I can only make out the shape of a black cloak. But before this final struggle, I see an infiltration, a dangerous game of hide-and-seek in corridors filled with enemies. The risks are high, but it is the only way to reach the one you seek. There is more than one way into this place. Your choice will dictate much. What else do you see, mighty oracle? Oh! Oh, such pain. I see two restless spirits. Crying out for revenge. These shades could help you destroy the Dark Force if they were to be brought back from their spiritual form. Yet this is only one possible path to your destiny. I'm afraid this is getting beyond me. I know very little about the afterlife. I can only advise getting counsel from the Druids. Be warm. The druids are reclusive and dangerous. They might aid you, or they might destroy you. Like their island, the druids' nature is hidden in the mists. There is nothing more I can do for you, except to give you this. It is water from the sacred pool. That, and my blessing, go with you. Thank you, Great Oracle.
Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. From the northeast come the sounds of mysterious drums and chanting. fire pit occupies a place of honor in the center of the little village. The fire pit, naturally enough, contains coal. The coals are cold. That's odd, because Alexander definitely smells the smoke of an open fire close by. Alexander reaches into the fire pit and takes a lump of coal. A wooden-handled scythe hangs against a bearskin on one of the tree houses. Alexander takes the scythe. The doors to the tree houses are bolted, and Alexander doesn't want to intrude into the private dwellings uninvited. From the east come the sounds of mysterious drums and chanting. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander decides to pass through the gate, preparing the shield just in case. The magic arrow completely shatters the shield. Good thing the arrow didn't hit Alexander. Flowering rose hedges grow on either side of the path winding north. Alexander can't do anything with the gazebo. Alexander takes a magnificent white rose from the rose hedges. Alexander walks forward to step onto the gazebo. But the rose hedges on either side of the path, sensing an intruder's presence, reach out their vines and blend together. The path is blocked. Alexander wields the scythe, determined to get past the magical rose hedges. The leaves fly as Alexander tries to cut the branches faster than they can grow back together. He sees light. He's through. <laughs> Who dares enter Beast's garden? My name is Alexander. I didn't mean to disturb your private garden. No. And yet, monsieur, you could hardly have accidentally broken through the three enchanted traps of the Isle of the Beast. Um, I, I suppose it is simply my nature to break through enchanted traps. <sighs> you must be a prince, then. I know the nature of princes all too well. This face you see before you is hideous, is it not? Well, for the face of a beast, it is really quite noble. Ha! I'm glad you like it, for you will soon own one just like it. I too was once a pretty prince, caring for nothing but adventuring and rescuing fair maidens. 
but I rankled one too many evil hags. One dark night, I was turned into this obscenity you see before you, warped in shape and trapped on this enchanted island over a hundred years ago. Surely there is a way off this island. Oh, surely. You broke in, did you not? And yet think, where would I go clad so eloquently as I am with this silk and this pelt? You see, my prison is also my sanctuary. You are the first to break through the barriers in lo these many years. That is, except for the druids who stole my heirloom coat of arms. If there's any way I can help... Help? You? I'm afraid you don't understand. The enchanted barriers were a warning and protection for you more than for me. Your prize for forcing your way past them is to join me in this dire life. By the laws of this sorcery, you are doomed to be trapped in the form of a beast. Your reward for broaching this garden is to be my slave, a slave as beastly as I am. You have only a few hours of humanity left. But that's not possible. There must be some way to break the enchantment. Spells always have a weakness somewhere. The enchantment you are under is tied to my own. Or the sorceress left me a way out. But I'm afraid it was only her final bitter joke. You see, I need only find a maiden to join me here, to share my castle, my life, willingly. Take another look at me. You can't help but admire the hag's terrible cruelty and cunning. I shall try to find such a maid, for Cosima's sake. Truly? How determined of you. I personally would not waste my last few hours as a man on an impossible errand. However, you may do as you please. I give you this token. It's my family ring, and the only heirloom I have left. If perchance you should... If you think you have found a maid... I shall give her this ring. Yes, she must accept it of her own free will. By doing so, she accepts me. Not that you shall find anyone, mind you. Your time is short. Count the minutes on your fingers while your fingers you have, pretty prince. Your master will await you. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander doesn't remember that sign being on the wall before. He decides to take a closer look. It's a proclamation. It reads, Citizens Rejoice, announcing the royal wedding and coronation of Wazir Abdul Al-Hazred and Princess Kasima. For reasons of security, the wedding will not be open to the public. Long live the new king and queen of the land of the Green Isles. Alexander feels his stomach turn at the thought of the dread event. If he doesn't do something soon, Cosima will be another man's wife. Looking at the serving girl reminds Alexander of the years he spent as a slave under the evil wizard Mananan. 
He wishes there was some way he could help her. She looks very shy and nervous as she tends her roses. The girl is too shy and fearful to talk to a stranger, especially a tall, handsome one such as Alexander. Pardon me, maid. I hope you don't think me forward, but I see that you like roses. I thought you might, perhaps, like a fresh white rose. Alexander can see the conflict in the girl's pretty face as she fights between her distrust of him and her desire for the white rose. The rose wins. Oh, I shouldn't, sir, but it is so lovely. I've never seen a rose of white. It looks so pale and delicate. Wherever did you find one of such a color? There are many hedges of them on the Isle of the Beast, and they grow together like magic. Oh, truly? What an adventure that must be to see them. But I should not speak so, especially to a stranger. Thank you for the rose, though, kind sir. is made of pure, heavy gold and bears an insignia possibly related to Beast's princely past. The small vial contains the oracle's sacred water. The water has a crystalline appearance. Alexander has a thought about the serving girl. He decides to bring up the subject of Beast with her. Let me tell you about the place where the white roses grow. The Isle of the Beast is an enchanted place. There's a path running through a deep forest. The path crosses three magic blockades, set to keep all visitors away. At the center lives a tremendous beast. Really? Magic blockades? How exciting! What kind of a beast? Is it very terrifying and ferocious? It is a beast that walks on two legs and dresses like a prince. It speaks with the voice of a man. A beast that talks and wears clothes? How is that possible? Is the beast magic too? Not magical. Enchanted. Beast was once a prince, but a witch trapped him in the form of a beast and set him on the island. There he lives in a castle in the midst of a maze. How terrible! Imagine how lonely he must be. It is a very lonely prospect, isn't it? Oh, I have met him, you see. He is indeed ferocious, but who would not be? He really exists? Oh, how it breaks my heart. If I could, I would tend to such a beast. Such a beast might find comfort in a kind face. Do you not think it's so? Oh, I think it's so. I very much think it's so. You would not be afraid of him? Afraid? Maybe at first. But how silly of me to speak so. The roses in this little yard are the only magic I will ever see. I could take you there. In fact, I would owe you my life if you would go. If you truly wish to go. You are serious? I could leave here? Oh, I have always dreamt of leaving. But to actually go. This is the only home I have ever known. Home is a hard place to leave. Even if you're unhappy there. But I will go. If I can help him, I, I must go. Is there nothing you wish to take with you? There is nothing. Then take this ring. It is his. He will be pleased if you would wear it. Why, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Thank you kindly, sir. 
Beauty, where do you think you're going? To a place where roses grow and to someone who truly needs me. I see you wear my ring. You willingly agree to spend your life here with me? Do you know what that means? Yes, my lord, I do. I have been touched by your story. Pity alone need not sentence you to endure this face. Oh, but it is a gentle face and kind. You look at me so sweetly and are not repulsed. Oh. By the light of your eyes, my spirit soars! The enchantment! It is broken! I am pleased to have served you, my lord. Do you still wish me to stay? What? Speak not such nonsense, beauty. Do you think that I learned nothing of true love during my time here? You are my queen. Oh, my clothes! This gown! How well it suits your noble heart. Alexander, how can I ever repay you? I have nothing to offer except my gratitude. But please, take these old clothes. Perhaps you'll find someone in need during your travels. You have already repaid me by your example of courage, beauty and by your friendship, I hope. You will always have our friendship and loyalty, Prince Alexander. But from a fellow adventurer, take some advice. If you find your true love, protect her with your life. They're all beasts without the redeeming humanity of love. And to aid you, accept my mirror. Now that my life is no longer hung in false shadows, I have no need for it. Give it to someone with nothing to fear from the truth it reveals. Thank you. I wish you both well. Come, beauty. Let me take you home. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. There's a small bottle on the coffee table. It bears a label that reads, Drink Me. Alexander picks up the bottle. Alexander gives one of the baby's tears a bottle of milk. The other baby's tears seem to resent Alexander's gift for some reason. Alexander collects some of the baby's tears in the old hunter's lamp.
Your Highness may as well spend her royal time contemplating something else. The lump of coal shall be sent to the Castle of the Crown under my name, and that's all there is to it. No, it shan't. Yes, it shall. If the coal is sent in your name, I shall royally decree a ban on all red on this isle. You do. And I shall royally decree that white shall be henceforth used for all mopping up of cabbage stew. You wouldn't dare! Oh, wouldn't I? Oh, it's you! Have you thought of any more of those brilliant ideas of yours? I found the two of you another lump of coal, so that you can stop fighting over the one you have. Oh, let me see! A lump of coal! And what a beauty it is, too! Marvelous! Now we can stop fighting, sister. Your Highness can just keep the old lump of coal, and I'll take this new one. Quite right. That settles everything. As a token of our endless esteem and royal favor, please accept this magnificent and truly incredible spoiled egg. Uh... Uh... Thanks. Let me see that lump of coal, Your Highness. It is a beauty, isn't it? Why, it's bigger than my lump of coal. Let me have it immediately. Over my dead body, Your Highness, it's my lump of coal. And it is indeed larger and much grander. Just look at that sheen. I demand you exchange with me immediately. Mushy swamp lies just off the path. It doesn't look like very good swimming. A mushy swamp. What do you think you're doing? You startled me. I was just getting some swamp ooze. Well, you certainly won't get it there! Swamp ooze? That's swamp sludge! He's right, you know. But he could be a little nicer about telling you. He's not a very pleasant stick in the mud. Nobody asked you! Be quiet! <gasps> oh, the trials of being a mere bump on a log. <laughs> I thought this might come in handy the next time your brother starts picking on you. Aha! Finally, old Bump on the Log's not so defenseless, is he? Hey! Hey! What are you doing there? Watch the pump, would ya? Now, Bumpy, remember all I've given you! The only thing you've ever given me is mud! Take this! No! Not into the swamp! Hey, okay! I give up! Jeez, sorry! Well, I guess it's not very pleasant having things thrown at you. I'm sorry. You mean it? Really? Brother? Brother! 
stick in the mud and bump on a log, exhausted from the battle, immediately doze off into naps. Rotten Tomato, being equally lazy, decides to join them. Mm. A glob of swamp ooze tossed during the brotherly fight has landed on the log. Alexander fills the teacup with the swamp ooze. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander. The little bottle contains some sort of potion and bears a label saying, Drink me. That's rather forward of it. Alexander searches the bottle for a clue about the potion inside, but remains unilluminated. Alexander suddenly gets a very sneaky idea. I can't go on anymore. Without Kasima, I'd just rather not live. Prince Alex, no! It's true. The Wazir has beaten me. I give up. Poison is my last resort. Stop. <laughs> I am... No. More. The poor young fool. He's dead, he's dead. Wait until Abdul hears. He'll be so pleased. I told you not to pop in like that. You can learn to knock like everybody else. Sorry, Master. I couldn't help myself. I have great news! Well, what is it? Prince Alexander is dead! He killed himself in despair over losing Kasima. <laughs> what? Are you positive? That young man has proven to be most devious. I saw the whole thing myself, Master. He was really and truly quite dead. Hmm. If what you say is true, it shall be most convenient. You've spent enough time on that little irritant. We must start thinking about the wedding. Anything, Master. Oh, I do love weddings. Well, we do want you to look your prettiest, don't we? Now, Shamir Shamazel, to the lamp with you. Prepare yourself as we discussed. Alexander's heart lurches to life in his chest. Prince Alex! But you... you were... Sorry, friend. I was doing a little acting, I'm afraid. Ah, of course, the strange cloaked man. You are quite clever, and a bit too exciting for an old man. Alexander's heart lurches to life in his chest. Prince Alex! But you... you were... Sorry, friend. I was doing a little acting, I'm afraid. 
Ah, of course, the strange cloaked man. You are quite clever, and a bit too exciting for an old man. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. This is the last page. Beauty's old clothes are very ragged and heavy. They consist of a long, thick dress and a headpiece which covers the hair and most of the face. Alexander searches through Beauty's clothes, but finds nothing. Alexander fills the hunter's lamp to the brim with the fountain water. Alexander prepares to enchant the hunter's lamp with the Make Rain spell incantation. Clouds of thunder, shafts of light, come and sup with me tonight. Waters three have I for tea, brew a tempest now for me. The lamp in Alexander's hand gives a little perk. He hopes the spell works despite his makeshift teapot. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation.
gods, did you see that? The man just appeared from nowhere. Perhaps he was sent by the spirits. I see no boat. He is an intruder, no matter how he got here. Grab him! Not again. Look, I'll leave. It's no problem. I think not. Let's go. Alexander is frozen at the spectacle before him. Robed figures are gathered around a bonfire. Some mystical ceremony is taking place. But as to its purpose, Alexander has no clue. We found a trespasser on the beach, Archdruid. Uh-oh. Archdruid. Now what has Alexander wandered into? This must be the foreigner we were warned about. How appropriate that he should come during our rain festival. Place him in the sacrificial cage. Wait! I must rescue the princess! There's an ancient druid saying, a man who would save others must first save himself. Alexander is pushed into the confining wicker cage. And the cage is swung out over the bonfire. Alexander starts to feel a little warm. The bottom of the cage is getting uncomfortably hot. This cage is really hot. Fire in the cage! Alexander pulls out Beauty's old slave clothes, desperate to beat out the flames. The flame is extinguished, but the clothes themselves burn to cinders. Alexander won't be able to keep the cage from igniting for long. The heat and movement must have jarred something. Something that Alexander's carrying is starting to jiggle around. Egad! Something's really percolating! The water in Alexander's lamp is hot. It's just about... Boiling! Alexander feels a drop. It starts to rain. That man is a powerful nature wizard. By the sacred oak, let him down! Apologize for our rude welcoming committee. We've been feeling inhospitable ever since the winged ones stole our sacred miniature oak tree. Besides, Wazir Al Hazred sent a message that we were to watch out for a highly dangerous foreign assassin. I assume you are the one he meant. I'm sure I'm precisely who he meant. I assure you, I mean to harm no one, unless that person threatens the princess. I'm sorry to have disrupted your ceremony, but I'm running out of time. What is it that you seek? The Oracle on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain told me I should speak to you about the Realm of the Dead. She told me of two souls in unrest there that I might be able to free. Free souls in the Realm of the Dead? You're mad! The souls might be able to help me on my mission to save the princess. It's imperative that I do everything I can. The risks are not important. No. And yet getting yourself killed will hardly help the princess. But I will tell you what I know. Legend has it that it is the right of any human to challenge the Lord of the Dead in order to save his own life or the life of another already past. But the knowledge of how to do this was lost centuries ago. I have only heard of one who tried it, 
A young knight who came to the land of the Green Isles from a distant land long ago. According to the story, he was determined to challenge the Lord of the Dead for the soul of his dead lover. It is said that he tamed the Lord of the Dead's horse, a black-winged, demon-hearted beast named Nightmare. Nightmare sometimes flies to the human world to feed on certain noxious plants. Those unfortunate enough to see her are glad to escape with their very souls intact. Somehow, the knight captured Nightmare and rode off on her back, supposedly to the realm of the dead. But neither the knight nor his lover ever returned. If there was a means for challenge, it was lost with the knight. I see. Can you tell me anything about the Lord of the Dead? Ah, that is a blacker matter still. To the druids, he is Samhain, Lord of coldness and despair. Samhain was once a man like you or I, but he insulted the gods and was sentenced to rule the underworld. Immortal he is and mateless, robbed of sleep, Robbed of movement, robbed of companionship. It is said that he hates all mortals even more for the mortality that he lost. That is all I know. Interesting. I shall remember. Now look how the oak embers of our bonfire still glow hot despite the rain. If you're bent on your course, you'll need courage that's just as impervious to the chill. <sighs> May your luck last longer than your storm, brave one. May it indeed. Thank you, Archdruid. from the bonfire are still smoldering despite the rain. Alexander scoops up some of the red-hot embers in the ancient human skull. Alexander is carrying a human skull filled with embers. The embers are glowing with heat. cracks the spoiled egg and dumps it into the skull containing the embers. The spoiled egg hisses as it makes contact with the hot embers. Sounds the steam. Phew, the smell of sulfur. Alexander puts the strand of hair into the skull containing the embers and the spoiled egg. Alexander pulls out his magic map. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. Alexander arrives at the top of the cliffs, somewhat winded after his long but uneventful climb. A mighty winged horse, the color of midnight, is feeding from the nightshade bush. The creature must be Nightmare, the one the druids spoke about.
Alexander solemnly speaks the incantation over the skull. Creature of night, to me succumb. Fire and brimstone, leave thee none. Purity bind thee like a chain to do whate'er I now ordain. Nightmare flares her nostrils at the scent of the fire and brimstone. That's it! Come on! I need passage to your homeland, fiery one! Unable to resist the power of the enchanted smell, Nightmare approaches Alexander. Her eyes appear glassy and sightless. In her hypnotized state, she is unaware of the human so close to her flank, or of anything at all except that marvelous smell. Now ride! Nightmare deposits Alexander on a strange, cold world. And some of the inhabitants don't look too friendly. Alexander hesitates to break the mournful, heavy atmosphere by speaking aloud. Who are you, grieving spirits? I am Queen Ilaria of the land of the Green Isles, and this beloved spirit is my husband, King Caliphan. We were murdered in our beds by our trusted wizier. Like a viper, he snuck in during the night and stabbed us in our sleep. Now my husband's soul is broken, and he will not speak. Then you are the ones I seek. Are you not the parents of Princess Cosima? Our daughter! Have you news of the princess? I know that she is alive and safely back in her kingdom after being rescued from Mordak. But I'm afraid I have not personally seen her. Alhazred is keeping her in her room in mourning for you. I am glad to hear of her return, but she will not be safe alone with that devil. Oh, that we could be there to protect her. Cosima, how I fail thee. My poor husband will never rest while our murder goes unavenged and our daughter is in danger. I came to take you back with me. Your people are still loyal to you. They need to know about the wazir. Kasima needs you too. But this is the realm of the dead. We cannot leave it. Nor for that matter can you. The only one who might be able to return us all to the land of the living is the Lord of the Dead. But he would never help us. He has no mercy. I might be able to convince him. I must try. Then take this. It is my ticket to the underworld. There you will find the Lord of the Dead. I cannot use the ticket as long as I'm chained here. And if we cannot be avenged, I will never be unchained. Thank you. Perhaps it will save us all. Be careful, young man. If you can ease my husband's torment and help our daughter, we will be most grateful. I will do my best. Goodbye, Queen Alaria. Uh-oh. One of the wandering ghouls brushes up against Alexander. The touch of the putrid flesh dissolves the living matter like acid. Tickets up! Next! Alexander's mother always told him to avoid bad ghouls. The spirit of a woman hangs like a puff of smoke in the air. She is weeping and appears to be very distressed about something. 
Why do you not rest, sad spirit? Rest? I cannot rest. My son is lost. Lost? You mean in this realm? No. His spirit is stuck in the land of the living, probably looking for me. But I cannot leave to go show him the way. My poor Ali. Is there anything I can do? Take this handkerchief. If you get back to the land of the living and find him, tell him that his mother is waiting for him here. By this kiss, he'll be able to find his way to the realm of the dead. I'll do my best to find him. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my Ali! To the left of the path, hand something to the spirits that approach the underworld entrance. Take it, please. Next. Alexander picks up the two bones on the ground. Now what do these bones remind him of? Ah, yes. Now I remember. The skeletons are overcome with the musical call of the bones. They begin to jiggle, then to dance. Alexander finishes his tune, and the skeletons resume their posts. Despite their frolic, they don't seem any friendlier. A key made of bone has fallen from the skeleton's key ring, and now lies on the ground. Alexander picks up the skeleton key. A uniformed skeleton stands guard at the entrance to the underworld. He takes something from the passing spirits and then waves them on into the underworld. Alexander is carrying a message from his beloved Cosima. The ghostly ticket reads, Admit One. I have a ticket. Oh, on. Next! Apparently, Alexander's not the only one who's curious about the body on the path. The knight is wearing one black gauntlet. There appears to be some writing on the gauntlet, but Alexander can't quite make out what it says. A knight's remains lie abandoned on the path. The knight, like Alexander, must have been alive when he entered the underworld. But for some reason, he never reached his destination. Alexander wonders if this is the knight the druid spoke of. Alexander takes the knight's black gauntlet and examines the writing on it. Flesh may cross the portal and seek its master death.
Flesh may go where death is trod, and challenge, like Scheherazade, he who reigns beneath the sod to spare a mortal's breath. Zounds! That sounds serious. Charon stands in his boat, eternal ferryman of the dead. Alexander can't quite make out what's under Charon's cowl, and he's not sure he would want to. Alexander scoops a little of the river sticks into the teacup with the swamp ooze, being careful not to get any of the black water on his skin. I must see the Lord of the Dead. Please, let me ride across the river Styx on the ferry. Charon apparently has rules as strict as those of the skeletons at the underworld's entrance. Alexander is not getting on that boat until he gives Charon the appropriate fare. Will these coins do as fare for passage? Charon accepts the fare and waves Alexander onto the boat. The large wooden gate at the end of the path is closed. Alexander reaches out to open the gate. Suddenly, the wood trembles beneath his fingertips. What touch has awakened my sleep? I smell the blood of a mortal. Reach out thine hand again, fleshy human, that I might devour it. It has been centuries since I last ate. Despite his fear, Alexander summons his bravest voice to command the living gate. I would pass, gate. I have business with your master. My master and thine, human. I would be pleased to introduce thee. Only step forward and thou shalt meet him shortly. No, thank you. I come to meet the Lord of the Dead with my flesh still intact. And why should I let you past, human, when I would much rather Eat you! I have been told that there is a way for humans to enter Death's realm. There must be something I can do. Some task that will allow me to pass through your doors, Gate. Hmm... I seem to recall something. A trick. Uh, perhaps... Um, a test. Mm. Ah, yes. Should a human try to pass, a riddle is Gates won't to ask. <clears throat> a riddle it is, then. And if thou wouldst fail to answer Gate, his thirsty jaws will be thy fate. Agreed. Listen as though it meant thy life then, human, for it surely does. My first is foremost legally, my second circles outwardly, my third leads all in victory, my fourth twice ends a nominee, my whole is this gate's only key. My first is foremost legally, 
My second circles outwardly. My third leads all in victory. My fourth twice ends a nominee. My whole is this gate's only key. The answer is love. Ah, thou traitor of the mortal plane! How didst thou guess love? That riddle should never have been solved. Love is unknown in this realm. Love cannot be banished, even from this place. There are spirits still pining of it on the surface above. Still less can it be banished from my heart. Enough! Burden me not with thy poetry. Pass through and quickly before I change my mind. The servants of the Lord of the Dead stand silently at the head of the path to his throne. In the center of the great cavern, the Lord of the Dead reigns over the hosts of the dead. He waves spirits into the sea of souls in an endless stream. What things the spirits tell him are best unheard by mortal ears. Alexander approaches the throne of the Lord of the Dead. Why have you entered my domain? still wearing your flesh. If you are so anxious for death, you might have found it easily enough in the land of the living. But since you are here, you are most welcome to stay. Kiss my hand, and you will be one with the spirits. There will be no pain. The gauntlet is made of black iron and has a message inscribed upon it. Flesh may cross the portal and seek its master, death. Flesh may go where death has trod and challenge, like Scheherazade, he who reigns beneath the sod to spare a mortal's breath. I did not come here to die, but to demand my right of challenge. I respectfully challenge thee, death by throwing down this gauntlet. Man may pass the portal and seek its master, death. Man may pass where death has trod and challenge like Scheherazade, he who reigns beneath the sod to spare a mortal's breath. He has the gauntlet! Impossible! He challenges death. Who are you to challenge death? A man of flesh is all I need to be, my lord. And what is it that you seek with this challenge? The soul of some dead maiden? I seek the souls of King Caliphim and Queen Alaria, the land of the Green Isles. You would save two human souls and emerge alive from this realm yourself? That shall be a difficult challenge indeed. The tomb does not open its doors lightly. Either all three of us leave, or none go. Very well. Then let me think of an appropriate task. Yes, I have it now. Your challenge is this. For thousands of years, I have sat upon this throne. I have heard every sad tale that can be told by human lips. I have seen tragedies that ended empires, injustices that defy reason. Love that would light the very stars turn cold and hard. I have seen torments that cannot possibly be born, and yet must be, for centuries. 
This thing I have never done. I have never shed a tear. Make me cry, thou man of flesh. That is my challenge. Make death cry? Sooner could he turn sea to stone, or fire to ice. If your existence has been all that you say it has, then truth alone shall be my sword. The mirror's surface swirls with darkness for a moment, then fills with images even blacker. Reflections of despair, of wailing souls, of shackles colder and more immutable than any forged by man, of a world of thirsts that can never be quenched. Alexander feels the mirror tremble in his grasp and is glad that he cannot see its face. But the Lord of the Dead is transfixed to the mirror, to the screening of his life. Things long forgotten are once more uncovered. His enslavement to this throne while still a man. The years of watching misery and horror and growing ever more numb to it. The seep of his own humanity. The slow growth of a new thing altogether which became that which he is now. His is an existence that has no possibility of redemption, no end. The surrounding spirits draw away in pain. The truth is so sharp it stabs, so intense it sears. <gasps> Take it away. Make it stop. The mirror of truth cracks from the strain, and death sheds a single gray tear. Truth is indeed a terrible thing. I have worn this mantle for so long, I had forgotten its dreadful weight. You shall take the souls and leave as I agreed. You have been granted to stay from this inevitable reality. I almost envy you. Find the souls he has claimed and bring them to me. King Calafim and Queen Alaria, I presume. Your hero has won you a few more years of mortality. May your souls be more prepared for their rest when you return. Thank you, my lord. I hope that they will. And you, man of flesh. My steed shall take the three of you back to the land of the living. Tell her where it is you wish to go. Until we meet again, then. I assure you, we will meet again. No offense, my lord, but I hope that will be many long years from now. It is never as long as you might wish, mortal. Now, be gone. Yes, my lord. Are you coming, Majesty? El Hazred's treachery must be handled carefully, Alexander. Alari and I must go gather our allies and form a plan. Watch over Kasima. Make sure she comes to no harm. We will return as soon as we can to take back all that has been stolen from us. I will keep her safe until your return. Thank you, son. Your love for our daughter must be deep indeed for you to have undertaken death itself for our sakes. Indeed. May we succeed in what awaits us, and live long together as a family.
An old beggar is peddling his wares in the village. He offers a variety of lamps, all neatly lined up on a long pole. Good day, peddler. Good day, sir. If you would like to get one of my fine new lamps, I'll need an old lamp in trade. Isn't it a rather bad business? Taking old lamps and giving new lamps in exchange? Well, there's always a chance that I'll find a genie. <laughs> if I had a genie, I'd be richer than a king. Besides, there's always a roaring business in antique luminaries. Alexander is carrying an old, battered hunter's lamp. The lamp is empty. Excuse me, peddler, but I have an old lamp that might interest you. Ah, an old lamp. And what a nice traditional design, too. Take your pick of my new lamps. Fine choice, my son. Here is your new lamp. Good day, and I thank you, sir. Good day. Drat! Another dud! Hello. I will be right up. Now, what can I do for you? How fare you, merchant? I have been reading too much love poetry lately. It is rather depressing to an old bachelor like me. Day, Prince Alexander. Would you mind if I traded this in? Of course, Prince Alex. Please choose something in exchange for the items on the counter. Alexander looks closely at the items on the counter to make his selection. I think I'd like the painter's brush. Very good, Prince Alex. The painter's brush it is. May your painting go well. Feel free to bring back the brush at any time. Thank you. The nightingale sings her crystalline song in the boughs of the old tree. The nightingale looks at Alexander curiously, as though waiting for something. If you'll only be reasonable, I really must see the princess. Be gone! You're not welcome at the castle, Prince Alexander of Daventry. We have our orders, and they are quite clear. The side of the castle is one big blank wall.
speaking the incantation would do little good unless there were a painted object nearby to enchant. Alexander dips the large black feather into the teacup and stirs the contents gently. To his amazement, the jet black color of the feather slowly drains from end to tip into the teacup. The teacup mixture blackens and thickens to a paint-like consistency. Alexander carefully puts it away, discarding the drained feather. Feeling artistically inspired, Alexander decides to make use of the large blank castle wall. Ah, a doorway. Just what Alexander was thinking this wall needed. With trepidation, Alexander gathers his strength for the enchantment of the painted door. Magic paint, black as ink, bring to life what I think, make it real what I draw, according... The spell worked. The door has magically solidified. Eager to be inside the castle at last, Alexander opens the enchanted door and steps inside. The magic paint door fades back into the wall. So much for an easy exit. line the east wall of the hallway. Alexander opens the dungeon door and slips inside. Mother? Mother, where are you? A spirit weeps inconsolably on the cot. The spirit appears to be the ghost of a little boy. What's the matter, little boy? I'm lost. I can't find my mother. I don't know why she would just leave me here. I've been alone ever so long. Mother? Mother, where are you? You must be the son of the spirit I met in the realm of the dead. She gave me this handkerchief and asked me to tell you that she's waiting for you there. It's Mama's. It even smells like her. I can feel her now. I know where to go. Wait. Before you go, is there anything you can tell me about the castle? I like to play in secret places. In the basement behind the Man of Steel is a door. Nobody except me knows it's there anymore. a door on the east wall. Alexander decides to find out what's on the other side of that door.
Prince Alexander! I can't believe it! How did you get into the castle? Well, I... Actually, it's a little hard to explain. I bet. <laughs> you run the terrible risk of being here, though. The castle is crawling with guard dogs, especially today. The Wazir will have your hide if he finds you. I know that, Jallo. But Kasima is being married today. What greater risk is there than that? Of course you're right. Young love. <laughs> I forgot what heartburn it is. But what are you supposed to do about it? I've got to try to see her. Maybe even stop the wedding. Is that all? And here I thought you would try something dangerous. <sighs> Don't worry about me, friend. Just tell me, where is Kasima? As far as I know, she's still in her bedroom upstairs. You'd never make it up there, though. The guard dogs are everywhere, and they're very loyal to the crown. Unfortunately, right now the crown means El Hazred. If we had proof of something truly a foul, the guard dogs might listen. As it is, they're your enemies, not his. I understand. I've had no lack of enemies since I got here. In fact, you'd almost think I wasn't welcome. There's probably a good reason why so many wish to harm you. I believe the Wazir's genie has learned of your presence on the islands. Tell me about this genie. Al Hazred brought the genie with him when he came to this kingdom. It is seldom the genie will take human life himself. Uh, usually he is more of a trickster and a spy. But that doesn't mean he isn't dangerous. In fact, he is quite powerful. If, for example, we could get the genie's lamp, then you could master the genie. Al Hazred and all our other problems would be solved. Hmm. Is that merely wishful thinking, or do you have something in mind? Well, I admit I have often daydreamed about owning that lamp. My fingers are nimble enough, and I could probably find a chance to steal it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the theft would be detected immediately, and I happen to prefer my neck attached to my body. If the theft were detected, Exactly. So, I have also thought if I had a replica of the genie's lamp, an exact replica, I just might be able to... Ah, uh, where would we get a replica of the genie's lamp? <laughs> uh, dreaming's pleasant, but I'm afraid it won't help to stop the wedding. But for Kasima's sake, uh, well, I wish you luck. I'll be here if you can think of anything I can do to help. Thanks, Jalo. Alexander has obtained a new lamp made of blue-colored glass with a tall, thin neck and a cork-like cap. I've been thinking of what you said about swapping a replica for the genie's lamp. I got this lamp from the old lamp seller in town. Do you think it will pass? Why, yes! It's an exact replica! That's amazing! How did you guess? I suppose it was intuition. Hmm. I'll have to wait for the right moment, mind you. But I should be able to get close enough to swap this for the real thing. And none shall be the wiser. Now you shall see Jalo's skill. I'm sure your hands are mightier than my sword, my clever friend. <laughs> Go ahead and do as you've planned, and let me worry about swapping the lamp. If I accomplish the trickery, I'll manage to get the lamp to you somehow. You never fear. I have faith, Jolo. You are a true friend. Ah, oh, shucks. I'd do anything for the princess. trunk provides minimal storage for the bedroom. The wall above Jallo's desk sports a notice of a circus. It seems very old. A 
cozy little fire is ablaze in Jallo's fireplace. A chandelier hangs down from the tall ceiling. How on earth does Jallo reach that thing to light it? The comfortable-looking bed in the corner is neatly arranged. It looks just large enough for Jallo's generous size. A large red rug with gold trim helps buffer the coldness of the marble floor underfoot. Jallo's bedroom is spacious, neat, and lush with dramatic colors. Like its resident, there's a melancholy sheen to its brightness. The colors of the stained glass windows glow with filtered light. door on the north wall bears a small brass plaque. The plaque reads, Guard Room. Uh-oh. In the corner is a suit of armor of ancient design. Its right arm beckons slightly. Remembering what the little boy ghost said, Alexander experiments with the suit of armor. He pushes down, then pulls up on the knight's right arm. Passage. Alexander hears the sound of voices coming from nearby. Alexander sees nothing of interest there. Alexander peers through the chink in the wall. Captain, I've been hearing rumors from the guards who've been watching the princess. They say lately she's been pounding on her door and begging to be let out. Ain't none of my business, sir, but news like that is upsetting the other dogs. Ain't no guard in the castle who would willingly keep the princess anywhere she don't want to be. A <laughs> Hazred claims that a foreign intruder is here to assassinate her. That's why she's got to be kept under lock and key right up until the wedding. Call me an old dog that can't learn new tricks, but I say the princess should be the one given the orders. al Hazred has been in charge for months, what with the king's death and Kasima's mourning. Tonight, the wedding will seal it, and there's nothing we can do about it. Like him or not, he's our liege. Need I remind you of your oath to the crown? Aye, we've an oath. For the sake of the princess, we'll not be forgetting it. He'd just better treat her well. Speaking of the Wazir, what do you reckon he's keeping in that magical room of his? It's not a magic room. It's just the door he's enchanted somehow. I say he's still got the royal treasury in there, along with whatever else he's so eager to protect. Not even the court treasurer is allowed in there anymore. I heard him in the hall the other day. He was speaking of that door. Black magic is what I say. I heard him say, Ali, but then Bay came up and started yapping at me. Enough! It is not our place to question the practices of our liege, no matter how strange. The wedding will be starting soon. Report to the throne room when you hear the music start. Alexander is standing in a secret passage of the Castle of the Crown. The landing is dusty, and the walls are deteriorating. To the south is the... Phew! That was a climb. Alexander hears the faint sound of a woman crying nearby. Alexander peers through the chinks in the wall, trying to locate the source of the crying sounds. Alexander's palms begin to sweat, and his heart to race. It's Cosima. He's found her. Psst! Princess Cosima! What? Who's there? It is I, Alexander. I'm here behind this wall. 
My, how suave that sounds. Alexander? It really is you! Oh, I knew you were close by, but how did you get inside the castle walls? It's a long story and not important now. You did get my ring. Oh, yes. It has brought me such comfort, Alexander, to know you were close by and had not forgotten. But you shouldn't be here. You're only endangering yourself. I don't care about the danger. I would brave anything to learn. What is it? Alhazred, do you want to wed him, Kasima? Oh, please believe me when I say that I never agreed to marry that man. Even when my father trusted Abdul absolutely, I never liked him. But with mother and father gone, I'm afraid there's no stopping him. If you do not wish to marry him, Kasima, you shall not. I promise you. Only come with me now, and we shall escape. How? I cannot fit through this wall. Besides, do you think I could leave my kingdom, my people, in Abdul's hands? But Abdul would tear the castle apart if I were to disappear from my room. You shall have to do what you can to delay his plans from your end. I can't just leave you here. Alexander, do not despair from me. I have been safe in this room for nearly six months now. Abdul can be in no hurry, whatever he plans. After all, I'm to be his bride, am I not? I have been planning too, you see. I believe I can escape. If I can only get a chance to lay my hands on a weapon, there might be an opportunity in the hustle of the wedding. But I... Shh, just a moment more, then you must go. Let us not waste time with words. Please, let me just look at you, dear Alexander. Here, take this dagger. It's not much, but it might come in handy. Why, it's perfect. This is just the sort of thing I've been looking for. Thank you, Alexander. I'll keep it close and use it if I must. Alexander looks with longing at the fair Cosima. She's even more beautiful than he remembered. Oh no! Someone's coming! The lock on Cosima's door rattles abruptly. Alexander, hurry! Step away before they see you! Alexander hears scuffling and a woman's brief cry from the other side of the wall. Then, silence. Alexander looks through the chinks in the wall, anxious to see what the commotion was about. Cosima is gone. Where could they have taken her? How could he have let them take her? A fine rescuer I'm turning out to be. are dirty and show the neglect of a forgotten place. Alexander hears the sound of scratching coming from the other side of the wall. The old walls are dirty and show the neglect of a forgotten place. The old walls are dirty. Alexander looks through the chink in the wall. Dear Shadrach, salutations from the Society of the Black Cloak, etc., etc. My long preparations are about to come to fruition. In a matter of minutes, I will wed the lovely <laughs> Kazima. Once I've established my power and my crown, I can stage another accident.
The princess has proven infuriatingly stubborn, as you know. She's becoming quite a dangerous little thorn in my side. In a way, it is a shame I have to kill her. She is lovely and would be amusing to keep around. But I can't risk her talking treason to one of the guards. So far, I've managed to keep her locked away, but I can't continue that forever. Well, on to it now. I'd send her to you, but as you know, I had no luck in doing so with Mordak. I close in triumph. King Abdul Alhazred. I think it's about time to see if Shamir has taken care of the wench as I asked. It's almost time for the wedding. The Wazir's words fill Alexander with blazing anger and fear for Cosima's life. That blackguard! That murderous swine! He'll not have his way if I have anything to say about it! There's a vague outline of what appears to be a door on the wall. Alexander sees lots of black cloaks. A canopied bed arranged with silk bedclothes and large pillows stands in one corner of the room. A storage trunk sits at the foot of the bed. The trunk bears a large brass lock. The trunk is locked. Alexander inserts the skeleton key in the trunk's lock and turns it. He hears a click. Alexander opens the trunk. It looks like the owner of this trunk is quite the correspondent. The stack of letters appears to be ordered by date because the top one is dated only a month ago. The books look interesting, but the castle is not a good place to relax and read. Alexander picks up the most recent letter and examines it. The letter is addressed to Abdul Alhazred from the wizard Shadrach. It reads, Greetings to a brother of the Black Cloak. I was sorry to hear of Great Mordak's death, though he was a bit of a ninny at chess. It seems the plans for that little kingdom of yours are coming along. I must congratulate you on your handling of the king and queen. Isolating the island so that no protest could develop was another brilliant stroke. It looks like there's not much left to stand in your way. Do as I recommended with the girl, and you shall have your crown. That fiend! Alexander opens the ebony box and looks inside. Inside the ebony box is a piece of paper with the word Zebu printed on it. There's an old bottle of black ink among the box's trinkets. Finding Gasima is no game of chance. The bottle contains only a small amount of black ink, most of it dried at the bottom. Alexander decides to leave it there. Alexander crawls back through the wardrobe to reach the secret passage. Alexander sees nothing of interest there. There's a strange door on the west wall. There doesn't appear to be any handle or keyhole on the door. 
Alexander doesn't see any way of opening that door manually. Since the door on the west wall has no visible knob or handle, Alexander decides to try to open it with his voice. He composes his words carefully. Listen, door. I would have you open. Ali Zebu. It worked. A small table graces the middle of the room. The table is covered by a velvet drapery. The initials AA are embroidered on the drapery. AA? That must stand for Abdul Alhazret. Decorative shields and spears made of gold hang on the treasure room walls. A gracefully curled trumpet hangs on the wall. Those trunks probably contain the kingdom's treasure, once guarded so well and used so wisely by King Caliphim, now in the hands of that blackguard al Hazred. Alexander pulls the drapery aside, curious as to what might lie underneath. On the table is a coat of arms with the head of a beast on the crest. Hmm. Beast said that his coat of arms was stolen by the Druids. This must be it. On the table is a fleece made of gold. That fleece must belong to the Winged Ones. And they thought the Isle of Wonder had taken it. On the table is a strange-looking stone that's giving off an odd, high-pitched noise. That must be the Isle of Wonders singing stone. Didn't the queens think that the beast had stolen it? On the table is a miniature oak tree. It looks very old. Hmm. That must be the sacred miniature oak that the druids thought the winged ones stole. As Alexander looks at the objects on the table, he realizes the depth of the wazir's cunning. It must have been the wazir or an accomplice who stole that one thing most precious to each island and then leaked rumors that one of the other islands was responsible. What did the wazir have to gain by causing the islands to hate one another? Alexander hears the sound of music coming from the east. It sounds somewhat classical, but... Oh no, it's wedding music. Alexander hears a door of the north hall open. Then, the sound of guard dog footsteps. The footsteps are headed this way. Alexander hears the sound of a guard's footsteps coming from the north. Wait. There are more footsteps approaching from the west. Now what? Alexander looks cautiously around the Grand Hall, but there are no guard dogs to be seen. The wedding music is coming from behind those two large doors. Prince Alexander, here, the wizier will have my head for allowing you within a mile of the royal wedding. Since you are of noble birth, I will give you five seconds to explain your presence here before killing you. I warn you, it had better be good. Alexander is carrying a letter taken from the wizier's trunk. Wait! 
If you love your princess, you'll hear me out. The Wazir is not what he appears to be. Kasima is in terrible danger. I have proof that this is so. For your princess's sake, you must believe me. Let me see that. Saladin reads the letter, his sword points still against Alexander's throat. Alexander watches the guard dog's noble face darken with rage. This is treason. I'll have his throat. But how do I know this letter is not a forgery? You could have written this yourself. But I did not. Have you no doubts of your own about our husband? Don't you see? All he wants is the crown. Kasima is being coerced. We must stop the wedding. It is true. I have had my suspicions about the Wazir, especially when King Caliphim and Queen Alaria died. But I have seen Kasima with him several times. She appears to be quite happy, even enthusiastic. I don't believe she could love him if he truly were so wicked. I cannot believe for a moment that she loves that snake. A jilted lover would not believe it. But come, see for yourself. leads Alexander into the throne room, where a ceremony seems to be in progress. Alexander feels his blood run cold at the sight. I, Kasima, declare Abdul Alhazred as my lawful and beloved husband and king of this realm. But, Kasima, what are you saying? Do you still claim that the princess is being forced? Perhaps it's you that's the danger, as the Wazir has said. Kasima, stop! Prince Alexander here? This is an outrage! How dare you allow this traitor to get past you, Saladin? You stupid mutt! Can't you even keep the castle free of assassins during your own princess's wedding? Kill him! Kill him now! <sighs> Lord Alhazred, with all due respect, you are not quite king yet. And this is a wedding ceremony, not an execution. What? How dare you contradict me, you flea-bitten mongrel! I gave a direct order. Obey me, or feel my wrath. Milady, I apologize for my behavior, but I am yours to command in all things. I wanted merely to hear your own wishes from your own lips. Tell me what it is that you wish me to do with this young man, and I will obey. Why, Captain, you heard my dear Abdul. If he wishes this atrocious young man's death, then I want nothing more than to see him get his wish. Obey thy liege now and always. As you wish, princess. Just as Saladin prepares to run Alexander through with his sword, a shout is heard from the direction of the Grand Hall. Hold! In the name of the true king! King Caliphim and Queen Alaria burst into the throne room, looking alive and well, and full of wrath. Behind them, a line of supporters look prepared to battle, if necessary, for their beloved royal couple. Kasima, darling, are you all right? Has he hurt you? Hands off of her, you murderous goat! If I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Mother. But, Caliphim, that's not Kasima. I'd know my daughter anywhere. What have you done with our daughter, you devil? The lovely image of Kasima suddenly bursts into smoke and is replaced by the Wazir's genie. Why, you, you... 
conniving serpent! Get him, guards! Saladin, your sword! Drat it all! You may have ruined my plans, but you won't get me! Or your precious Kasima! Get them, Shamir! I command you! He's getting away! Stop him! Yes, sire! As soon as I deal with this genie! Shamir, the wazir's genie, begins to throw balls of dazzling light at the guard dogs. Alexander, be careful! Al Hazard has a sword! Shut up, wench! Shamir Shamazel! Get in here! Here I am, master! It's about time, you bumbling fool! How could you let him follow me? Well, there were the guard dogs, master, and then... Never mind! Just kill him! Kill him now! <sighs> As you wish, master. Razzle, dazzle, snap and snazzle! Alexander, I did it! I swapped the lamps! Here, quick, take it! Bless you, Jarlow! I knew you could do it! Now get clear, friend! No argument there, my lord! Good luck! Alexander has the genie's lamp. Shamir Shamazo, hold your spells. I am your master now. I order you to go back into your lamp. How did you get my lamp? You thief! You... you... you've ruined me! My lamp! Oh, thank Balhalla! I hated working for that loathsome creature. I already feel his nastiness leaving me. How I've longed for a master like you. I've got a new master. I've got a new master. So, you are a thief as well, Alexander. Stealing the lamp was very clever, I'll grant you that. But I am the master thief. Face my sword if you dare. The man left standing shall have the lamp. So shall it be, Al Hazred. I don't need the genie to deal with a coward like you. Inspiration. Alexander fixes upon the only weapon in sight. Zounds! This sword must weigh a ton. <laughs> Good. Then you shall only fail sooner, my prince. So, the mouse would bite? This mouse shall bite, as you shall soon see. Or should I say, Soon feel? Ha! You can barely lift that sword, my prince. Better to lay it down now. I promise to dispatch you with little pain. A tempting offer. But I think I'll wait and see you what this sword can do. Suit yourself. <laughs> tremble under the effort of wielding the huge sword. His muscles are nearing exhaustion. Ha! 
And so it ends. Not if I can help it, you murderer. Kasima thrusts the small dagger into Alhazred's shoulder with all her might. Ah! You! You dare raise a finger to me? You will regret that, princess. Kasima, are you all right? I'm fine, Alexander. I was just so afraid for you. There's no need to fear anymore, Princess. Yes, I know. How can I ever repay you? For myself? For my kingdom? It was not in me to let harm come to you. Can you find it in you, Princess? To give me more than your gratitude? Alexander! What are you saying? I love you, Kasima. Would you ever consider... Do you think you could... marry me? Could you ever have doubted it, my prince? Princess Kasima, are you well? I'm quite well, thank you. Please take Abdul and put him in the dungeon. See to it that he gets a doctor. Yes, Majesty. Kasima and Alexander ask Captain Saladin to perform their wedding ceremony. Saladin is honored to do so. On this historical day of great joy in the land of the Green Isles, we witness the union of Kasima, beloved princess of this realm, and Alexander, Prince of Daventry. Do you, Prince Alexander of Daventry, take Princess Kasima to be your wife to love and to cherish for as long as you both shall live. I do. And do you, Princess Kasima of the Land of the Green Isles, take Prince Alexander to be your husband, to love and to cherish for as long as you both shall live? I do. Do you have a ring? I have Alexander's royal insignia ring. Very good. Please place the ring on Kasima's finger. Who gives this bride to be wed? Her mother and I willingly give our daughter's hand in wedlock. Who will speak for the groom? I will. Alexander's mother and I recognize his marriage to Princess Kasima with glad hearts and sanction this union. Then, Alexander and Kasima, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Hooray! Congratulations, my children. I have an important question for you both. Please hear me. Yes, sire? Alexander, I welcome you into our family with open arms. I place trust in Alhazred because I so badly wanted a son and a husband for my beloved daughter. I was wrong. But you are true and good, Alexander. You have proven yourself to all my people. Thank you, sire. Olaria and I have been through much, even though we have returned to our kingdom. I do not think we are able to reign again. Will you two consider the crown? I know as king and queen, you can heal this small kingdom from all the damage that Alhazred has inflicted upon it. 
Oh, father. Why, I'm honored. What do you think, Cosima? I love my homeland, Alexander. I would be happy to stay and serve it all my days. Father, I believe I'm needed here. Would you be very disappointed if... Son, you must follow your destiny. I do believe the land of the Green Isles needs you. You'll be a magnificent king, though dearly missed in Daventry. Then, I accept. Oh, my boy, what a man you've become. And how I will miss you. Don't worry, Mother. With Shamir's powers, we'll be able to visit often. I'm not about to forget my family. Mm, congratulations, Alexander. I'm so proud of you. Thank you, dear sister. Oh, Alexander, I'm so glad. Between the return of my beloved parents and our new reign, you've made me so happy. I'm glad I could make up for some of your suffering, my beautiful wife. Congratulations, King Alexander. When we return home to Daventry, your crew will be glad to hear that their battle at sea was worthwhile in bringing forth a new monarch. We were so worried when your men arrived home without you, son. I'm so thankful that you are safe and happy. And I am as grateful that my crew did not pay for my driven heart. You have only brought us all good fortune, sire. With Shamir saved and his power used for good, reuniting the islands will be far easier. He has already repaired the ferry. Your road will be easier now that the islands are no longer feuding. Already the wounds are starting to heal. Yes, my love. Discovering the island's stolen treasures has done more to bring peace to this land than anything else. It is now clear that Alhazred had Shamir steal each of the island's most valued treasures, then blame the thefts on others to cause the islands to hate each other. Now let us celebrate our good fortune. The evil that has plagued this land is done, and a new reign begins. Long live King Alexander and Queen Cosima. Long live King Alexander! Long live Queen Cosima! Long live the land of the Green Isles! Hooray! Do you haunt 